So the second part of the two chapters for this week are on the minimum wage and the impact of unions. So we left off talking about labor markets and what the demand for labor and the supply of labor looks like um, and how changes in the wage rate impact the amount that workers or employers want to hire. So suppose that the government were to impi impose some higher minimum wage um, or some higher wage restriction than the market says is efficient. Well, that's going to give us a picture that looks a little bit like this. Let's make this a little bigger. So, we have our downward sloping labor demand and labor supply, as our theory says we should. And in addition to that, we we're originally starting at this WE right there, but then the government restriction is at some higher level WM. So at a higher wage, now employers are having to pay more for their workers, so they don't want to hire as many workers as they did before. So they go for QA to QD, or QE, excuse me. And then as the wage goes up, more people decide they want to work or work more. And so that causes the quantity supplied of labor to rise. And so there's a lot of people that want to work, but not too many people have jobs. So there is a surplus of workers. So some workers are going to be very happy because they're going to still have their jobs and they're going to get paid more to do it. Some workers, however, are going to lose their jobs. So clearly these workers are not going to be happy. That would be the ones that were previously employed here at QE, but are not at QD. So there are job losers. In addition, there's going to be new workers who now decide they want to look for work, but they can't find jobs. And that's going to be this gap here. It's the those who are entering the labor market but are unable to find jobs. Make that smaller again. So there's always this question, do you increase your capital or your labor? And in order to increase output, firms may choose to hire um, more labor or they could decide to add more capital. And this is going to depend on the cost efficiency of both. The cost efficiency is the amount of output associated with an additional dollar spent on an input. So how much more output do you get if you decide to spend a dollar on capital versus a dollar on labor? And whatever is the most cost efficient input is going to be the one that produces the most added output per dollar. So the one that can produce more with only a dollar of the input is going to be more cost efficient because you get more output for the same dollar of input. The increase in the input, or if you, so you're going to want to increase your input with the higher cost efficiency. Because remember, cost efficiency is the amount of output per dollar input, and so we want larger numbers there. In countries where labor is very, very cheap and capital is very, very expensive, work is labor intensive. And that's because you don't get as much of an output bump from this increase in capital as you do in labor. Whereas in countries where labor is expensive and capital is cheap, relatively speaking at least, then work is going to be much more capital intensive. So earlier in the semester we talked about the US's switch from having high labor jobs such as farmers and miners and uh, factory workers to much more capital intensive jobs, most of them at desks, using more of your mind than your brawn. And that's because we've made this switch. We're much more expensive labor-wise and much cheaper capital. So most of our work is capital intensive. So that's the end of that part of the labor market. There is a discussion on unions as well. So unions were developed in order to create market power in labor markets 
where certain areas or occupations where the worker had very little control of their working environment. And the employer worked more as a monopoly employer, and so if you wanted to have a job, you had to accept their conditions. So labor unions came about to sort of be this collective unit of all the workers working together to sort of improve their working conditions. So in order for a union to be successful, a union must be able to exert, excuse me, the union must be able to exert control over the labor market supply curve. And this means that a union wants to be what we call a monopoly in their provider of workers. Because remember, the supply of labor is the workers. So they want to be a monopoly supplier of workers in the industry. And so the idea is that they concentrate on a specific part of the labor market. That's why we see often industrial unions or craft unions focusing on those specific market um, or type of workers. So the main objective of unions is to raise wages to members. Now they do other things such as improving the working conditions or the job security for their members as well as the retirement co funds, vacation time, health insurance, and other benefits. In their earlier days, they did a lot to make sure that there was safety in the workplace. Um, and so this is all to be for their union members. So unions operate like a monopolist of the supply of labor, as we said earlier, which means that the union faces a downward sloping labor demand curve and the marginal wage slopes downward as well. This looks a lot like the marginal revenue and demand curve from our monopoly chapter. I'll throw in a picture here so you can see what I'm talking about. So, labor unions want to set employment where the labor demand or supply, excuse me, is equal to the marginal wage. Just like a monopoly sets the marginal revenue equal to the supply curve. So it's going to be this point here, which in this example leads to a quantity of two. Now they're not going to charge three. They're going to go up to the demand curve and charge a wage rate of four dollars per hour in this example. So However, because of this higher wage rate at $4, we have this number of three people wanting to work per hour, but only two will be hired by the firm. So more people want to work at this higher wage rate than there are jobs. So unions must exclude workers from the market. Not all workers can be parts of this union because the union cannot ensure jo jobs for all three, only two in our graphical example here. So, what is the impact of a union in a market? Well, first, wages of union members are going to be much higher than of the non-union workers because the union will do nothing to fight for the wages of non-union workers. The union also restricts the number of workers keeping up the pay to their union employees. And this pushes these displaced workers that want to be working into other non-union locations, causing the supply of non-union workers to increase and thus non-union wages to fall. Unions may also inhibit the productivity leading to increased costs and increased prices of the goods they produce. So, 
There's been restrictions on how much they can do, such as the Bricklayers Union had restrictions on how many bricks could be laid per hour, and I assure you it was not the number that they could physically do, physically do but much less. So this does lead to productivity falling, um, and whenever you're producing less per hour, that means it's costing more to produce the same number of built walls in the case of the bricklayers, and therefore increasing the price of a brick wall. So, unions have declined in their numbers um, over the most recent years, and many of them have ended up merging to consolidate power. Now, there's multiple possible reasons for this. One is that, in general, they provided a incentive to have a safer workplace, and now our legal system does a fairly good job of that on its own. So there may be less of a need for them. Also, some of their restrictions were just becoming so costly that they got pushed out by the compete, competing non-union workers in certain industries. Um, so, that concludes our section on unions. I hope this was helpful as well.